Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Alrighty, folks, today we are visiting with Celeste Citrini, and she is one inspiring soul. I have had her on my list of people to interview for quite some time. Celeste is a rancher in California, and she's going to talk about her family's journey in being resilient and still being able to keep the ranch and the family despite the challenges they face that from the regulations that California is imposing. Now, this is only part of the conversation and part of her story. If you've ever heard of Celeste or follow Celeste, she is a woman who wears many hats in the beef industry. And we also talk a lot about her own businesses that she started, as well as her role as a leader in the industry and why she finds it important for cattle producers to be leaders in their states, in their country, and really stand up for anything they believe in. So it's a really fun interview, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did because I had a blast covering it. Before we dive into that, I do want to remind you that if you're looking for a speaker for your next Zoom event, in-person event, whatever it may be, I am still booking workshops and keynotes for 2023. So whether that's about podcasting, rural businesses, or advocacy, um, or if you have another topic you'd like me to speak on, please reach out to me. My email is casualcattleconversations at gmail.com. With that, let's hear from Celeste. Well, all right, Celeste, it is great to have you on the show today. I know I, I don't think I can pinpoint the first time I actually met you, but I know it was, uh, it, I think my mom introduced us and it was definitely at a Red Angus event, but so it's been fun to be a friend and follow along and I'm really excited to have you on the show today. So thank you for agreeing to share your story with us. Absolutely. Thank you. And yeah, I think it was your mom had introduced us back at, I think we were in Colorado, maybe for um, a convention a few years back. And so I'm um, mm-hmm. always happy to talk about what we do here in California on our ranch and um, answer questions from folks that like yourself that have podcasts and are doing so many great things for our industry. So happy to answer whatever you want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I wanted to have you on the show because you are a woman with very many hats in the beef industry. And so I kind of want to talk a little bit about that and hit on some of your leadership roles too. But before we dive into that, you know, you already mentioned that you're on a ranch in California, but would you explain to the audience kind of your background in the beef industry? I know your ranch is rich in family history and you do a lot of other things too. So I guess when someone asks you, what do you do? How do you describe that? Yes. Well, our family has been here on this ranch. Um, We're located in the Salinas Valley, which is about 20 miles inland from the Pacific Ocean. And so our family 108 years ago came and settled here on this place. And my brother and I and my mom are still here uh, making a go of it. Uh, We have a commercial cow-calf Red Angus Ranch. And then in addition to that, we have a farm um, right around our home place here where we lease it out for, uh, right now actually it's in strawberries, but it's usually either strawberries or row crops. And so my dad years and years ago um, had farmed as well. Um, farming in California is very tough, especially if you don't have lots and lots of acres. And so I was just made sense for us to lease our ground out to someone else. And so I kind of help in the management of that now as well. What's the main challenge that is making farming tough in California right now? Oh boy, where should I begin? Um, there's, I think it's, you know, no matter what state you're in, I think there's always something that we've got going on with our government that, um, you know, things that we have to deal with. Here in California, water is a huge issue. Uh, water quality, uh, food safety, uh, to just kind of give you an example here on our home place, Uh, We have our house and surrounded by the house is all of our farming ground. And then um, up a little ways, we had a feedlot here at the house. And every year we'd bring our calves home. That's where we would background them here at the ranch here at home. And then we'd ship them out after they had been weaned um, right here off of our farm. 
Well, a number of years ago, um, I don't know if you can remember, there was a big E. coli outbreak here in California mm -hmm. um, in spinach. And when that happened, they have made so many regulations now that we cannot have cattle anywhere near our farms. And so we were blessed that we have a ranch in the foothills where now all the cows reside. Um, and we have the set of corrals and everything else up there that we can take care of everything. Uh, we were very lucky in that sense because a lot of friends um, actually had to sell um, you know, their animals. They didn't have a place to go with them because they were surrounded by farming ground. And so uh, now there's all sorts of different um, regulations that you need to follow. There's setbacks in all the fields that are near um, any kind of, you know, even in the foothills, uh, so many setbacks if there's farms that are near those foothills. And so you go through all of the rigor morrow of that. Uh, water quality, there's a lot of issues on water quality that we have to stay up on top of. I get a little bit frustrated with that because, um, you know, there's creeks that run through, through the ranch or below the farm and you know, nobody's going to go in there and go swimming or do all the things that they think, you know, people do, mm -hmm. I guess, in our creeks. There's usually, there's such a drought or has been such a drought here in California that um, those creeks haven't even ran for years and years and years. So it's a little bit frustrating, but just dealing with all the paperwork of that, making sure that all of your, uh, oh, any kind of gas pumps that you have on the ranch are registered. And, um, you know, they come out and check that once a year and the paperwork for that. So it just seems that there's always something that I've got to stay on top of to make sure that we can continue uh, to do what we love to do. You have a lot of regulations and paperwork and that's, that's quite a bit. How have you worked to still adapt to the times with all those added restrictions and still maintain your operation on your family land? Because you could have left, but it sounds like you're adapting and still making things work. Absolutely. You know, we, I look at it this way. We love what we do. We have, um, I've got a beautiful life here. And just because there's all these restrictions that come up, it doesn't mean that they're going to you know, eventually someday, probably they'll push us out of ranching here in California. I mean, I can see that in the future happening at some point. It just gets harder and harder. Um, but for the time being, we just do what we need to do. Um, take one day at a time and any kind of regulation or process that I need to learn about, I make sure that I know everything I can about that. And I think that's the one thing that makes it a little bit easier is when a restriction comes up, you're, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, we've got another thing to yet to deal with. But, um, you know, they always say that knowledge is power. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really true. Because when you know what you're um, up against and you learn to understand it, you learn to uh, meet and communicate with the policymakers that are making all of these regulations, then it makes it a whole lot easier. And I am very transparent of what we do here on our farm and ranch. Um, recently had a real fun um, project that I worked on with uh, the California Beef Council where we opened up the ranch and kind of just shared everything that we do. And they made um, a series of commercials on that. And it was going to be um, aired, let's see, it was April through August. I get the, guess mm -hmm. they'll air on ABC7 News um, out of the San Francisco Bay Area in all the major media um, areas here in California. So um, that was pretty exciting to be able to share our story and talk about what we do. And I think that, you know, the more people that understand what we're doing, the easier it is for us to kind of mitigate through all the paperwork and all the yuck that I need to mitigate through. <laughs> so do you do a lot of work with the California Beef Council to try and advocate and share the true story of ranching in California? Yes, absolutely. I am um, actually a member of the California Beef okay. Council. I sit on their board. Um, have been there now for a few years, and I have really enjoyed that um, 
they've come out probably two or three different times here in the ranch and filmed full days worth of filming to use for different things. Um, and this last project was one of the big projects that we did. Um, I, I didn't mention that they they use those commercials for um, Disney Plus and all the Disney Plus streaming services. So when someone's watching something on Disney Plus, a little you know commercial will pop up talking about California ranching mm -hmm. and the beef industry and the face behind the rancher. And so I am a real advocate of that. Um, really enjoy talking about what we're doing and just sharing the story that you know, like I tell a lot of people, we're not doing anything wrong. And so a lot of times the media makes us out to be these big, bad uh, farmers and ranchers. And yet all we really are is a family owned operation that's just trying to make a living and, and continue doing what we've been doing for the past 108 years. So is public encroachment a big issue for you guys or how far are you from, say, a larger city? Like, is that growing population impacting what land is available for you? Um, actually, here at our home place, I am a half a mile from the city. Um, our home now, like I said, is farming ground and our, our house here. And then my brother, he has a home here as well. Um, but the Salinas Valley is the salad bowl of the world, they say. And Salinas Valley is full of farms. Um, so there is a lot of farming. However, the area that we're in, in eastern Salinas, it seems like development is coming closer and closer. And it was probably, oh gosh, it's been a good 10 years where we had to, oh gosh, it's been probably more than 10 years, probably 15 years, where we had found out that the city wanted to build a highway through our farm here. And so we didn't want that to happen. Um, so we had our land use attorney and uh, kind of investigated a little bit. I went to a lot of meetings and fast forward um, after a year or so of, I don't want to say fighting, but <laughs> fighting for our cause, I guess. Um, it came down to a big meeting with um, the city council and city planners. And I was there and our attorney told me, you know, Celeste, I think it would be best if you were to share the story of what you guys are doing, why you ranch, why you farm, why you love to do it. And I was not prepared. I mean, that is not the plan. She was supposed to go up and give her little spiel of what, you know, why we wanted mm -hmm. to save our, our ranch. And uh, she said, I really think it would be best coming from you. And I think that's where my advocacy journey first started is, was that day, because I got up and basically said, you know, that we appreciate um, anyone that has a farm that would like to sell and, 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 you know, put houses on it or do whatever you want to do with it. Um, we appreciate that. And I respect that. But I also, you know, want you to respect us that we want to continue farming and ranching because that's what we love mm -hmm. to do. And so um, it was, it was just crazy throughout the afterwards, there was public comment. Um, and I couldn't have planted better people in the crowd if I had to. Um, it was quite an emotional deal. We had a number of people stood up that I didn't even remember who they were, but young people that were in 4-H that had come to our farm and my dad had put together livestock judging classes for them. Um, there were some other kids that came mm -hmm. and said that they had a vegetable garden in 4-H at our house. And if they didn't have that, they would have never even known what a farm was. And so, so many of these great little stories popped up. And at the end of the day, um, after this very uh, stressful meeting with these city council folks, they decided to uh, postpone the project and um, let us keep our farm a farm. And so, um, like I said, that's been probably 15 years or more. And, uh, you know, eventually someday that's, I think it's, we know that someday where we're located, the city will come here. Um, our foothill country where the cattle are, that is not near city. Um, that's about 15 miles inland. And um, that for right now, you know, we're fine. And you look at pictures of me on Facebook or Instagram or any of my social channels, you would never know you were in California. I don't think in those photos, I get that comment a lot. It's like, wow, this doesn't look like it's California because it's so much open space. But 
Uh, California actually does have quite a bit of open space. And I think it's, uh, they say there's only one county in California that doesn't have cattle. So that's really kind of an interesting little tidbit. Because when you think of California, I think everybody thinks of the beach and big cities and that sort of thing. So we're, uh, we're trying to, to keep plugging along. I'm always staying on top of stuff and just, you know, we want to keep doing what we do. So for right now, that's, that's where our focus is. Well, from what I can see, you're doing a great job. Now, why did you, I kind of want to take a step back. Why did you choose to stay in the beef industry? Because everyone, you know, has that choice once, you know, you grow up on the family ranch and you can kind of choose like, do you want to pick a different industry? Do you want to pick a kind of supporting industry or do you want to stay in the beef industry? Why did you choose to stay involved with the beef industry? Um, I always tell people that I don't think I chose to stay in it. Um, it chose me. And I love this industry and the people and everything that's affiliated with it. Um, I went to Cal Poly, graduated in 1991. Um, and I really, that's what I wanted to do was come back to the ranch and help run the, the cattle and be involved with that. And at the time my, you know, I was getting close to graduation and my dad said, you are not going to come back here and raise, you know, punch cows for a living. You need to get out, get some real world experience. And then we can see about you coming back and doing that. And so um, I was actually in the produce business. I was a commodities broker for 25 years, graduated from Cal Poly, came home, worked um, selling uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and brokered that for 25 years, sold to major restaurant chains and uh, places like Costco. And I had a lot of restaurants in New York and on the East Coast. And that was my base of um, customers. And the produce industry really uh, helped me in everything that I do now, because it was a very aggressive, very uh, male dominated industry at the time, a very difficult industry, but yet one that I learned a lot and was a whole lot of fun. And so um, I thought I'd start out there and, you know, I started out like as a sales coordinator and I figured, oh, I'll stay here for like a couple of years and get some experience and then go on and do something with the beef industry that I really wanted to do. And it ended up 25 years later, I was still there, um, always still working here on the ranch and being affiliated with that, but always knowing that someday I was going to have my dream of helping um, other ranchers tell their story and showcase the good things that they were doing. And I, I think that stems from as a young child, I was heavily involved in show, showing cattle and, you know, you'd go to an event and there was always at a sale or at a show, there was all the, always the field representatives from the different livestock magazines that were there. And I always thought, gosh, it would be so great to be a livestock representative for either a magazine or a field man or you know, it seems like they've got the best job. They get to see all the people and they get to write stories and take pictures. And I knew that someday that's what I wanted to do. And so uh, fast forward to now, about 10 years ago, that all kind of came to fruition um, quite unexpectedly, actually. Um, my dad, unfortunately, uh, passed away in a tragic accident here on the ranch, which forced me to quit my job with the produce company to come home to run the cows with my brother. And so I uh, started doing that and then uh, created all the things, the wonderful things that I am doing now within the beef industry, which is really pretty exciting. So um, yeah, it's something I always wanted to do. I just kind of took a little while to kind of get back to it. Well, I, I always say, God's timing is better than our own. So it obviously happened for a reason. <laughs> hey folks, I want to take a quick second to talk about a company that's truly helping beef producers advance their herds. Vitelli is the most accessible, reliable, and predictable reproductive solution. Operating in 21 countries with 15 global IVF labs, Vitelli is setting the new standard in bovine reproduction. Vitelli's simple, innovative, hormone-free IVF system allows you to multiply more of your best genetics faster. In the U.S., the 30-plus satellite partners and seven regional labs makes it easier for you as a producer to access Vitelli's technology. Once you find a location near you, all you need to do is bring your cow. 
That's right, there is no donor setup or added labor. Their hormone-free process is easier on the cattle and simpler for you. Grade 1 embryos are created in the lab to the mating of your choice, and their simple, outcome-based pricing structure ensures you only pay for the embryo produced. Visit their website, www.vitelli.com, that's V-Y-T-E-L-L-E, Dot com to see how Vitelli can ensure your herd is always progressing. And that link is also in the show notes. So you said, you know, the ranch and you said all these other wonderful things you're doing in the beef industry. I know one of those is the bull sale bulletin. So can you talk a little bit about what that is and how you, you know, started that, how that stemmed, how that sure. fuels parts of your passion. So a little sure. bit on that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, like I said, always wanted to do something, work with other ranchers and, uh, kind of showcase them and tell their story. And so 10 years ago, I got to thinking, you know, what can I do? How can I do that? Now that I'm back home on the ranch and running the cow deal, I got to have some other extra stuff. I'm always got, you know, a million things going on. Mm -hmm. And so, um, out here in the fall is our major bull sale season. Uh, the months of, but, excuse me, the month of September. And so I thought, what could I do to help those people um, showcase what they're doing? And so I created um, a little deal called the Bull Sale Bulletin, where the first year I went around to all the purebred sales and I told them, I'm going to come to your sale. I'm going to take some pictures. I'm going to write some stories and I'm going to do that all complimentary for you. And if you like what you see and you like what I do the next year, you know, maybe you can hire me on. And so I was very fortunate in uh, the fact that the majority of those people that I reached out to uh, hired me on. And so I created this business where I um, helped them throughout the year with just, you know, sharing social media posts that they might create. Um, I do a lot of behind the scenes, you know, this is the face of where your bulls come from, um, sharing rancher profiles and that sort of thing, all on my um, social media channels, the Bull Sale Bulletin on Facebook and Instagram. And then on sale day, I'm there taking pictures, I do interviews, um, I do a sale recap. And that has happened now the, the last few years, but more recently this last year, I'm focusing more on bringing uh buyers to the bull sales and so that's something that's super big because i think you know you've got pictures and that's wonderful and the story's all warm and fuzzy and great but bottom line what a, a bull sale guy wants is for you to bring some buyers to his mm -hmm. sale and so um have worked very hard at trying to do that and uh this last year was pretty successful in that and a whole lot of fun and so um that's how the bull sale bulletin began it's just kind of showcasing other folks and um we're now into you know year 10 of doing that and um really have had a lot of fun with it and it seems like every year there's more and more things that i add to it or kind of tweak and make it a little different so uh it's good stuff well i always appreciate a good story like that you knew what you wanted to do so you just created the experience <laughs> Yeah. And taught myself everything. It's like, that's one thing being an older person getting into social media. Um, there were so many things I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how do I do this? Or how do I do that? Or how do I, you know, even picture taking, it's like, uh, how do I take a picture? You know, someone had given me a really nice camera way back when, and I'm like, okay, I need to learn how to use this thing. And so, um, just kind of taught myself everything. I sit on a, a board at Cal Poly for the ad communications department and thank goodness for all the young people there. Cause they have taught me so much of the things that I need to do. Uh, and also have a 15 year old niece that is pretty savvy on all kinds of social media stuff. So she helps me quite a bit, <laughs> but never stop learning is my motto too. <laughs> Always got to keep plugging ahead and learning something. Absolutely. Learn something new every day. That's so, right. Okay. So you just said that you were on another board and you had talked about being on the board for the California Beef Council. And I know you've had other leadership roles. Why do you choose to be a leader? Because being in those leadership roles, like 
I understand volunteering and being a leader. It can be rewarding, but I also know you're not usually getting paid. It can pull a lot of time and energy out of you too, away from other things. So why are you still choosing to be a leader? What drives you to be active and involved in those roles within the industry? Um, I think definitely it's the people. And I have slowed down a lot from what I was. Um, gosh, in my in my 40s, I was um, a crazy woman. I had so much stuff going on. Um, probably my biggest thing that was pretty exciting. I was the state president for California Women for Agriculture. And I led, we had a 3000 member organization at the time that I um, was blessed to be president of for three years. And let me tell you, that was just a experience in itself in being able to travel all over the United States, um, talking about California agriculture, sharing the story about what we do. Um, and I think it, for me, it was just empowering other people, you know, and getting them involved and getting them excited. And um, from that stemmed so much other, th so many other things. I had a, um, oh, for about two years, I was so lucky to go to so many different states throughout the United States and speak at different events, um, talking about um, just empowerment and getting people excited about their farms and ranches and what they were doing and that the, the things that we're doing are bad and to celebrate that. And I think the people that I met along those journeys um, were ones that kind of fueled me to keep going. I remember one in specific event I was um, in, uh, oh gosh, it was in Kansas. I had gone back to, it was the, um, Reno County Cattlemen's Association, I think it was Reno County, um, Cattlemen's Association annual meeting that I spoke at. And I talked about how it was so important for us to celebrate the good of what we're doing in agriculture and to celebrate our farms and ranches and to be a voice. If we, you know, I, I talked about the story about our farm and how the city tried to take our farm and that we just really didn't want that at the time. And so that I shared that with the city council and kind of shared experiences and what was on my heart and all that sorts of things. And this little man came up to me afterwards and he grabbed my hand and he had tears in his eyes and he said to me, I wish I would have heard your talk a long time ago because that happened to us and the city now has our farm. And it, it just broke my heart, but yet it pushed me in the sense of, I've got to keep doing this because I'm not afraid to talk in front of people or to talk to radio or be on podcasts or TV or whatever it might be. And so hopefully I can reach families like this man and, and, and you know, before something like that happens to give them kind of the little push that they need to be proud of what they're doing and to share the story. And so um, through all those leadership roles, you know, they were beneficial for others, but they were, you know, really beneficial for me too, in just making me a better person and um, in sharing the story and encouraging others to do the same. So what challenges have come with being in those leadership roles? Um, I think just kind of organizing women. <laughs> and that sounds terrible, but when you're, when you, um, you know how girls can be sometimes it's like, God bless us, but sometimes it's kind of crazy. Um, and I think the challenges were we all had, you know, the, the groups that I've been involved with, everyone has so much passion with what they believe in. And I think sometimes we, uh, you know, we need to work together to make those passions work um, instead of nitpicking and fighting and bickering with one another. And, uh, and I, th I think that's kind of the challenge. There's so much that we, we all have so much that we're so focused on and wanting, wanting things to, to work. Um, you know, our ideas to work. And then everybody else has those ideas too. And so sometimes it gets convoluted with so many ideas and so many things going on that we need to kind of corral all that energy and kind of focus on why we're all here. And bottom line, it's usually the passion of, you know, saving farms and ranches or the passion of our cattle or whatever it might be. And once you can find that, then we can all, kind of all come to a happy medium. And I can say I've been pretty blessed in in my leadership roles. And, you know, I've always been very fortunate to work with a lot of great people and uh, 
but yeah, sometimes it can be a little challenging with so many personalities and um, that sort of thing. <laughs> you brought up um, trying to get people to work together, right? Do you think, you know, you brought it up as a, you know, in your groups and the women's groups you were a part of, but do you think that's a theme in the beef industry as a whole where we need to work together a little more or what are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. I think that the beef industry, you know, anytime that I uh, speak to a group or talk about um, our industry, I get a lot of questions about, you know, what kind of beef is best or, you know, we've heard that uh, grass fed is best um, or we've heard that organic is best. And at the bottom line, at the end of the day, it's all beef, whether it's organic, grass fed, conventional, homegrown, you know, put in a feedlot, whatever it might be. And it's the same with all the breeds that we have, you know, Red Angus, of course, I think that's the best, but I'm a little, you know. Well, me too, but, but me too, but I try to keep the show unbiased, but I'll, yeah, I support your I opinion. Know, I know, <laughs> I cover a lot of Angus sales and I got a lot of Angus friends and, you know, her, I showed Herefords as a young person. So we're kind of, an, uh, we're kind of, Swiss, I try to be Switzerland when I'm dealing with all these things, a neutral country, but, you know, we have all these breeds and all these different methods of producing cattle, but at the end of the day, it's all beef. And that's what we're trying to push. And I think that that's something that we need to kind of focus on. Um, it's not that there's one is superior, more superior than the other, or one way of, of, you know, growing out cattle is better than the other. At the end of the day, you know, we're here as an industry. And I think if we have had more of a unified voice as an industry, beef industry, rather than all these different segments, I think we'd be a lot better. Um, is that going to happen? Who knows? It's, it's, it's tough, but, um, Anytime I go and speak to a group or talk, um, that's the way I, you know, I have my preferences of what we do, but like I said, it's, it's when people are at the grocery store, you know, beef is beef and, and there's all kinds of different labels and things on there, but at the end of the day, we're all trying to sell it. So I always say it takes all kinds of kinds. And I mean, I think there are definitely I certain like principles, there are definitely certain principles that I think all beef producers should be following when we look at how we're managing and handling animals as far as health and nutrition and just making sure everything's good there. And, you know, looking at genetics too, but, you know, not everyone can do the same grazing. Not everyone can do cover crops or the same types of cover crops. You know, it's very regional and we have to be able to respect that. And, you know, I, I love my corn fed beef. I really do. But if people can connect yeah. with the consumer and with grass fed beef and can still tell a good story about beef, that's just as important. Like it's what works yes. for you. As long as you're telling the okay. true story of beef, I don't really care. <laughs> as long yep. as you're telling a good story. Right on. Yep, exactly. So what advice do you have for maybe the 20 and 30 year old cattle producers who are wanting to be leaders and are also back home on their operations? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that comes to mind is always be authentic. Um, that is my big thing is be true to who you are and meet everyone that you can, whether it be in person or on social media, uh, whatever it might be that, that is, I, I think that is the testament. And I hope I don't sound you know, snotty, but the testament to my success as a 51 year old, I think I've been pretty successful in the stuff that I've done. Um, not only with, you know, the cattle and with my bull sale deal, um, we didn't mention a couple other things. I'm involved with the livestock market now and, and mm -hmm. I'm a rep for them and, you know, just different things that I have going on. And I think it's because I just asked for it and that I met everyone I could. And, um, I, and those things sound simple, but yet so powerful. Um, you know, I mentioned the livestock market. That's, some, that's another thing. I always wanted to be a rep for a livestock market when I was younger. And, you know, that's out here anyway is a very male dominated business. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, you know what? I, you know, I raise cattle. I know what's going on. I, been around it a long time. And so I had done some work for a local livestock market here in the area 
Um, actually, it's over in the other valley. And after about a year of doing PR and marketing work for them, um, I just said, hey, if you need somebody to be a rep over in our area, let me know. And here we are. So um, just ask for it. If thing, you know, it's not always going to be a yes from the other end, but a lot of times it will be. I mean, if you're working hard and you really want something and you ask for it, a lot of times you're going to get it. Um, very few times in my life have I ever been, you know, not saying that I haven't been turned away or said no, but for the most part, it was always either a yes or, hey, let's try this. And so I think those are my three big things, you know, being really authentic, meet everybody you can and just ask for it. And like I said, that sounds simple, but it's pretty powerful. It, it is simple, but can be challenging for some reason. And I'm not sure what can you know, it's probably all mindset. And like, it's something that I've gotten more comfortable with too. And definitely having this podcast has helped where, and I've had great mentors who have helped introduce me to people, but sometimes it seems, um, it just seems challenging. Maybe that's not the right word. I can't think of what I'm trying. I want to say, but to go introduce yourself sometimes or meet new people. But at the end of the day, I've always found, like you said, that even just a simple introduction of yourself can be powerful. It might be a few years down the road, but that connection makes a difference at some point. Right. Right. And I think it's, it's, it's wise to, you know, jot down all the good things about yourself. And I know that, you know, I have done that before because sometimes, and I don't know if it's a girl thing, you know, I like, you know, sometimes it's like, Oh gosh, this or that, but over the years, you know, people might pay you a compliment, like, gosh, mm -hmm. Shay, you're so organized. And your podcast is just you've got such a great speaking voice, you know, whatever it might be. And so jot those down in a little notebook and just have them all the good things, you know, and then every once in a while, when you're having a crappy day, or, you know, you're just not feeling it, look at all that stuff. And I, I do that. And it really, it really does make it for me anyway, it makes a difference because we all have those days where it's like, oh, you're not feeling so great. But then you take a look at that and you're like, you know what, I am doing great or I have worked hard. And so I think that's important to always keep track of all of the good stuff that you're doing and the good characteristics that people share with you. Just kind of put that in a little pocket there in your desk and, and have it handy for when you're having a not so snazzy day. Absolutely. I don't necessarily do exactly that, but I'm going to start now, but I'll look at old thank you notes from people when I'm having a yes. day. I'll go back yes. and be like, okay. And then I was just actually working with a business coach who made me make a 50 list is what she called it. And it was like 50 reasons why my knowledge and experiences are valuable to my podcast audience and my rancher mind members and stuff like that. And I was like, I, and it was tough. It's hard to go through, but it's, it's really powerful to go through too. When you look back and say, you know what, I do have something to offer. And I think no matter what, if you have your own business, if you're an employee, like just as a person, you need to take the time to go through and think about that or write down those compliments, like you said, because it's easy to discredit ourselves in a society where we compare ourselves so much. Yeah. And I think social media does that. I mean, I, you know, look at people that are doing similar things with me or like me on social media, whether it be with the livestock market or whether it be, you know, with my promotions, with the sales. And sometimes I think, oh gosh, you know, Am I doing as good a job or whatever? But sometimes mm -hmm. I think that fuels you too to kind of check that out. And it's like, oh, I, you know, certainly not that you want to copy anybody or do anything like that, but kind of just get new ideas or see even your mom. I think years ago, I might've asked her like, what am I doing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> and sometimes you don't know, but I don't know. I've learned too with social media and the stuff that we put out there and we share, they're really aren't a whole lot of rules as far as just being who you are and sharing the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is what it is. So absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, before we wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts you want to share or anything else you want to talk about? Oh, 
Oh, gosh. Um, I don't think so. I just think this is great. Anytime. I think you're doing a fantastic job. So we're going to give you the yay team and <laughs> anybody that can do a podcast and, and have the commitment to do something like this on a regular basis is, is just awesome because, um, you know, that's hard. I think anytime that, you know, you're going back to the, the, my advice to young people, I think just do, do it. I mean, I think with your, like your podcast, you haven't been doing it all that long, but it's something that you really wanted to do. And so you just start doing it. And I think we need to take those chances. I think, you know, that's another big thing is just take some chances and it's scary, but for the people looking on the outside, I mean, me looking at you today and doing this, you would think you'd been doing this your whole life. I mean, you know, it's crazy. You don't really, you don't really realize that you think that I think we're so critical of ourselves and what we're doing. And yet, you know, when we take those chances and do those things like we're doing, we're doing good stuff. We just don't need to be so hard on ourselves. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you very much for being on the show today, Celeste. It was a fun conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Shay, for all you're doing. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.